Okay. I think it works. So, firstly, good morning. It's very nice to see so many of you. I didn't. I really thought there would be less than half of this after the party last night. It was um, it was fun. I've seen a couple of people come in like MacBook in one hand, croissant in the other hand, like Drupal. Why? Um, but it was good. I learned a lot about Drupal last night. Um, I'm a Drupal beginner, kind of. I used to use Drupal when it was Drupal 4, maybe Drupal 5, a long time ago when I first got started in web development. Um, and I tried it, and like many people, the learning curve was a little bit too steep for me, and I went, ah, WordPress, it's easy. Um, but it's, you've come a very long way since then, and um, so have I. So that's what I want to tell you a little bit about today. Um, so for context, um, my name is John O'Nolan. My Twitter handle is on the screen right now, in case you want to tweet me to tell me how wrong I am at any point throughout this presentation. Please feel free. Um, and to give you a little bit of context about what I do, where I come from, um, I've been a web designer for about, I don't know, eight, nine, maybe ten years. Um, at the moment, I travel and work, um, as some people do, simultaneously, kind of on a non-stop basis. Um, so I go from place to place, working, and that used to be with clients, uh, with customers, um, like many of you here do. And these days, it's more on my own stuff. Um, so up until recently, or up until about a year ago, I was one of the core contributors to WordPress. So I come very much from a PHP background, which is pretty close to, to Drupal. Um, and now I'm working on a new project called Ghost, uh, which I should tell you a little bit more about in a second. But the main point of this talk, and what I hope I can bring to you, is not to tell you how cool my project is, but to just tell you about some lessons that we've learned along the way that I think can apply to any project, including Drupal. Um, and that centers around focus, um, which is, I think, one of the most important and probably one of the most critically missing parts of open source that's sitting between open source going mainstream, really, is a lack of this. I'm going to try and tell you why. So first of all, what is focus? Um, you can think of it as inbox zero. You can think of it as a camera's focus. You can think of it as a lot of stuff. But in this context, I'm talking about focus realistically as the art and science of saying no, um, which is something we don't do enough of. But before we get into that, um, there are two things I want to talk about. And the first is the beauty of open source. Uh, and that's this amazing paradigm that we've all witnessed over the years. And so that started out something like this. Um, in the 1960s, we had this idea of software development. This is how it works. You have a company, which is an office building. You put a bunch of happy little green developers inside it. You give them some food and occasionally a little bit of money. And eventually, they churn out an application. Amazing. Um, then you copyright the fuck out of the application, you sell it to as many people as you can, you get a whole lot of money, and you give some of it to the developers, and the whole cycle repeats. And as things started out, we are pretty happy with that. that. That worked. Then this crazy hippie dude came along and was like, well, maybe we could do that differently. How about we take away the office? We don't make people work in a corporation, and we get rid of this weird copyright thing and we actually do something that would eventually evolve into open source. And that grew, and we found out it worked. Eric Raymond's essay, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, proved this insight into the open source community and the open source world that really meant development didn't just have to be locked down to this traditional model of a company or a corporation. So at this point, we had this amazing open source thing that was just working. And we were like, company? More like lolpenny, am I right? Ridiculous. So the entire web is built on open source, which is pretty cool if you think about it. But the weird thing is, like, how is the most important invention of our generation, of this decade, of this century, arguably in the history of the world, how is the most important invention of all those things, powered by open source, all these things, and most people have no idea what the fuck any of this is. How did that happen? Something has to have gone wrong somewhere that that happened. It seems a little bit weird. And this is where I think we get into what I lovingly refer to as the curse of open source. Because while we were first looking at this development model and how software is created, in a real production line sense, um, what we haven't looked at really is the decision making model. And that's really interesting when you start comparing a company to an open source project. 
So a company, like we said, traditionally has this office and it has developers inside it, but it also has external factors, which are customers. And the problem with external factors, or both internal and external factors, is everybody has an opinion. And people love their opinions. You will have developers on the inside saying, let's rewrite this bitch in Rails, because Rails is awesome. And people on the outside saying, I want features. Give me features. I don't care if it's fast to make it pink. And all of these requests and opinions and things have to be managed somehow. And in a company structure, they have this pretty cool thing called a business model, which comes in really, really handy when you need to hire people to do something that's not development. So they have this single point, which is a person. They can centralize all of their requests through this person. And at any given point in time, all of the requests go to the person who can then say no, which is really useful. Traditionally, we call this person a designer, sometimes a product manager. Either way, someone who's not a developer. And that creates a very focused decision-making cycle, which seems quite obvious until you compare it to the open source alternative, where we have a shit ton of people all over the world, a shit ton of customers all over the world. The decision-making tree looks something like this. And when it comes time to actually do something, um, there's not a lot of people saying no. Because everybody has opinions and everybody has their idea about what should work best. And it gets pretty confused. So where a traditional software development company, given any brief to produce a product, might come up with something like this, an open source project, given the very same brief and the same resources, might come up with something like this. Everybody knows what a Ford Focus is. Not a lot of people know what an MIT Land Rover LR3 autonomous vehicle entered into the DARPA $2 million grand prize challenges. And yet we look at it and we think, <laughs> probably for all the wrong reasons, we still look at this and think, but that's fucking cool. Look at it. <laughs> I know you're saying it's wrong, but look how cool it is. <laughs> it's got fucking cameras everywhere. <laughs> and yet, it's as cool as it is, the mainstream is the Ford Focus. So why is it so hard for open source to focus? Why is it so easy for us to create amazing products, but so hard for us to create mainstream, widely adopted products? I think there's a lot of reasons, not least of which the always imminent threat of someone saying, well, I'll fork it then. But one of the biggest is probably that when you say no, everyone will disagree with you, even when you're right. And this isn't a case of when you say no, someone might disagree with you. When you say no, people will disagree with you repeatedly, vehemently, and sometimes quite aggressively. When you say no to stuff, people don't like it. And we've experienced this ourselves, I'm sure, within the Drupal community, both from the inside, the people requesting stuff and saying no, as well as from the outside, perhaps requesting stuff on other projects and being greeted by the moron who says, no, you can't do that. People are very inflexible towards saying no, and sometimes you can have immensely right decisions of saying no and yet still be greeted with pushback. So a great example of this, one of the classic minimal products of our time that said no to almost everything, no to every feature under the sun except basic MP3 playing, was the first iPod. Came out in 2001 to the classic review from Slashdot, saying no wireless, less space than a nomad, lame. Okay, and uh, over on Mac Rumors, it was greeted with equal enthusiasm. All that hype for an MP3 player, breakthrough digital device, the reality distortion field is starting to warp Steve's mind if he thinks for one second that this thing is gonna take off. <laughs> what a dickhead. Ten years later, iPod had sold 304 million units. And yet, at the beginning of its life cycle, most of the stuff it received was, it hasn't got this, it hasn't got this, why hasn't it got this? And we see that time and time again, especially in Apple products, the first iMac, where's the floppy drive? Where's the fucking floppy drive? The first MacBook Air, where's the optical drive? I can't believe there's no optical drive. Why did you say no to that? New MacBook Pros, oh my God, there's no Firewire. Saying no is really hard, but sometimes it really is the right decision. It's just knowing when to stick by your word. Um, so that's one really big 
issue with why I think open source has a hard time saying no, but there's another one, potentially a bigger one. This one really pisses me off, to be honest, and it's what I call platform thinking or module thinking. And this is really deeply ingrained, especially in the tech scene, potentially in open source even more than the tech scene. And it's this, it's really epitomized in this statement that we love, everyone probably in this room loves this statement. The most amazing thing is that people use this product in ways we never even imagined. Who the fuck came up with that? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely insane. Have you ever used your car in a way that Ford never imagined? Do you think they never imagined you would drive it down a street? If you did something with your car Ford never imagined, there would be a lawsuit against Ford because you probably would crash and kill 20 people, including three kids. That would be bad. <laughs> These things need to be imagined. What are we creating that is so impossible to imagine? We are not making a light bulb. If you're making a light bulb, maybe that could be used in ways people could never imagine, but we're not. We're creating software. Software should imagine how people will use it. We should stop getting stuck in this trap because here's what it looks like when you start thinking about new features. Look, here's a new feature and let's try and run it through the decision-making model of the iPad. So does it make a better MP3 player? So let's say uh, Bugs Bunny ears, fluffy ones. Does it make a better MP3 player? No. If it does, we'll put it in, but it doesn't. Now here's what happens when you run it through the old tech favorite of could this project, could it enable people to use this product in a way we never even imagined? Fluffy bunny ears. Fuck yeah. Can make a party out of that thing. Fluffy bunny ears, like for my kids, I don't know. The answer is always yes, and that's a huge problem because sooner or later, after a month, after two months, after a year, you end up living in an open source house that looks like this. And then no one is happy. The problem with this platform thinking, this module thinking, occasionally, is that we end up with stuff that has no clear purpose. We have a thing that can do a lot of things, but it's not for anything. And while that can be amazing in a component sense, in a product sense, it can be really problematic for people to be able to actually understand it. And from an open source point of view, we often start with this perspective. We build the technology because we love technology. There's always new stuff happening. It's very exciting. It's one of the most exciting industries in the world to work in, I believe. So we play with the technology, we end up building something, and then we figure out how people are going to use this when really what we potentially should be doing is looking at it slightly the other way around, of figuring out how people want to use something, and then build the technology to make that happen, to make it possible. So, for two and a half years or so, I worked as the deputy head of the user interface group for WordPress. And I got into that um, doing a lot of blogs, for companies, that was kind of my contracting work. And eventually, excuse me, one day, I decided um, I'd like to give something back. So I started contributing to WordPress, did that a lot more, did that a lot more, um, until eventually I was helping lead their user interface team. And that was a fascinating, fascinating project. But what pains me about it is when we talk about open source user interfaces and design, this is 10 years worth of, well, people can do anything that we never even imagined with it. And this is considered to be one of the better slash best user interfaces in open source. And it's pretty complicated. It's, re it's really quite, com there's like at least 300 links on that page. And that's considered to be the good one. So I think we can really do better. I think we have an opportunity to do much, much better, given that kind of baseline. Um, so I was contributing to WordPress two and a half years. Um, enjoyed it. Always was trying to make the user interface better, make the user experience better. And eventually it got to the point where I realized that WordPress has really evolved. So in the beginning you had WordPress, blogging platform, Drupal, content management system. Right? This is the age old debate between you guys and us. This is you. We would say WordPress, and you go, ha, ah, that's just a fucking blogging platform. Get out. You want a real website? Use Drupal. Um, and for years, WordPress would go, no, we're not just a blogging platform. We're, we can do more. We have pages. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't laugh. It was like a 
<laughs> that was a fucking critical feature. Um, <laughs> And it, it's been like this. It's been like this for 10 years. And the thing is, I think you guys still say WordPress is just a blogging platform. Um, but it really isn't anymore. It's really not. And I'm, I'm not saying that as a WordPress enthusiast. I'm saying that as just a realist. It has really grown up where to the point now, WordPress is following in the footsteps of Drupal kind of two or three years ago. It's pivoting itself to be what it's calling an application platform. Um, it has custom post types. It has multi-tenancy support. It has custom taxonomies. It has all the things that you have different names for. I never did figure out what a node was, by the way. Like, seriously, learning curve, node, I don't know. Um, it's really evolved into something much bigger than just a blogging platform. And I realized at some point about a year ago that all my clients um, were big companies, but they were asking me to build blogs for them using WordPress. And I'd built a couple of my own blogs as well. And using this, I would found it increasingly frustrating to just build a blog, a publication. I found it very easy to use WordPress to build a large static site, or sorry, a large uh, kind of business site. Um, but just a blog or a publication or multiple authors writing together was getting really, really hard and really frustrating. So one day, um, after thinking about all these theories about why we should say no and why we don't say no more often in open source, I got out my notebook. I was sitting in um, Egypt, a place called El Guna last year, and I started writing down all the things I would say no to. If I had to build WordPress from scratch right now, um, completely rethink it, here's all the things I would say no to, and I would strip out and make it super simple, just as an idea. So I wrote this blog post, um, and I said, WordPress is so much more than just a blogging platform. And I had put together some ideas around these notes I made in the notebook, and a couple of mock-ups of what I imagined it could look like just as an idea, they're almost wireframes, like really basic designs, as you can kind of see scrolling past there. And I thought, I was hoping this post would get a couple of hundred views. Uh, maybe someone would sort of say, hey, that's cool, and that would make my day. Um, that didn't happen. What did happen was it hit the top of Hacker News and got a quarter of a million page views in the space of about of a week. So that was larger than I expected. Um, and the overwhelming response was people saying, you're right, WordPress has gotten into this big hulking thing. And the blogging platform were actually pretty, pretty good. So you should make that idea into a real thing. And the response was so large and so positive that I thought, oh, well, I'd be pretty stupid not to, to do something with this now. So originally, uh, what we wanted to do was to create a plugin for WordPress that would kind of take this pretty designs, simple blogging system, and put it on top of WordPress. And that would all be fun and good. You'd have the same themes, the same plugins, the same open source ecosystem that WordPress has made for 10 years. Um, and we realized pretty quickly that trying to build Ghost on top of WordPress was a little bit like this. No! What are you doing? Stop! It didn't really work. And we were hitting the same constraints with PHP from a technical standpoint, with from a philosophical standpoint, from every possible standpoint in building a Ghost on top of WordPress, we were bumping up against the exact reasons that we created Ghost for in the first place. So it made no sense. And eventually we realized that trying to fit into this kind of model actually looks more like this. And then we realized that looks more like this. And when you start thinking of an open source community like an island, then you start wondering if you can get off the island. Did you see what I did there? Getting off the island? Thank you. That was just for you guys. I got like one yes down here. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we went out in search of blue waters, new things, and we landed upon a little place called Node.js Island. And so we started thinking, well, okay, if we're not going to build this on top of WordPress, um, it's not going to be a fork, as I understand, like you guys have with Backdrop, which nobody likes. Um, so then we need to make something completely new. So if we have the freedom to choose everything, so we're not constrained by inheriting a license, we're not constrained by inheriting a technology or a database, if we can start completely from scratch and just say, Let's make a blogging platform with any technology we want. Where do we start? And we looked at a couple of things, but the most compelling of all of them 
um, was Node.js. And I will tell you why in a little bit. But for now, what I'm going to do is show you what happened three months later, which was after the decision to take this idea, build it with a brand new technology, I made the questionable decision to throw it up on Kickstarter. Um, because I thought, well, it's very easy to get a few hundred thousand people to go, yeah, that's a good idea. It's a lot harder to get a few hundred thousand people to go, yeah, that's a good idea, take my money. That part's weird. It's, people say no at that point. So I thought this would be a good test. Um, and I'm just going to show you what that looked like. Maybe. Ghost is a blogging platform that is free, open source, beautifully designed, and available to anyone who wants to use it. The concept of the blog has transformed journalism in the last 10 years, like the MP3 did to music, so some of the biggest ideas and discoveries of the last decade have been broken through the blog. And yet, in the last 10 years, not a lot has changed when it comes to the software. We're still stuck with stuff that's complicated, more complicated, full of cats and porn, or simply has no sign-up button whatsoever. And Ghost is what's going to change all of that. I know how to build blogs, and I know how to build blogging platforms. I've built blogs for Microsoft, for Nokia, for Virgin Atlantic, for EasyJet, and for many others. I also spent two years working as the deputy head of the WordPress user interface team. But WordPress has grown up. It's not really about blogging anymore. It's moved on to be about websites and content management and all sorts of amazing things. But what I care about is blogging. WordPress, by all rights, is no longer just a blogging platform, and that's exactly what Ghost is. It's just a blogging platform. It has a beautiful dashboard that shows you everything you need to know about your blog in one place. Managing your content is as simple as browsing through it. When you need to edit your content or write new content, you can see Markdown on the left and Preview on the right. It's one of the most simple and beautiful ways of writing for the web that we've ever had the pleasure of using. Uploading images directly in place where it will appear in your content just works. And adding tags or categories is quick and easy. It's mobile optimized, it'll work on any device, iOS, Android, whatever you have. And tablets as well. The split view works in both portrait and landscape modes. We've built Ghost around three really important principles. The first of that is that Ghost is built for its users. A lot of open source projects suffer from being targeted far too much at developers, and that's not what we're doing. The second one is that Ghost is free. The MIT license means you can do pretty much whatever you want. No restrictions on themes, plugins, conferences, or anything else, really. Lastly, and most importantly, Ghost is being made for love, not for profit. If successfully funded, it will be set up as a not-for-profit organization. Now, why should you care about that? Because it impacts on our motivations when we're creating the software. Do we want to make millions and sell to Facebook, or do we want to make something that's genuinely good and serves its users, not its investors and shareholders? It's not just me working on this. I have an amazing team working with me who have the technical chops to make this happen. Rob Hawkes, technical evangelist for Mozilla until very recently, did the first pass on the ghost code. And now, heading up our technical team is Hannah Wolf, senior developer at Moo.com. We've worked really hard to get to this point, and we've got a working prototype. But we need your help to finish Ghost and to ship it to the world. It's not just about blogging, it's not just about making something that looks good, it's about giving writers tools to push blogging and to push journalism to the next level. We're not just making this because we want to sell it, we're making this because it needs to exist. Ghost is about the future of the freedom of speech, and it needs your voice. It's funny, in, in that video I say, we've got a working prototype. Like, just how basic that prototype was was unreal. Like, if I clicked on anything in that video that was not exactly the thing I clicked on, the whole thing would have fucking exploded. Uh, like, that drag-and-drop file upload? <laughs> you know when you drag an icon onto any window, and you let go, and it goes, bing! It goes back. It did that. I just cut that part out. <laughs> Fantastic. I found out, like, six months later, that's completely against Kickstarter regulations. You, you're not allowed to fake a prototype. It's just a small part. Um, so the Kickstarter experience was interesting. Hectic, uh, crazy, really insane. Um, so we, we had an initial goal of 25,000 English pounds, so around 28,000 euros. Uh, we hit that in 11 hours. And within two days, we had 100,000 pounds. 
And by the end of the 29-day fundraising uh, campaign, we had uh, about 200,000 pounds or about, I think, 230,000 euros. So that was bigger than expected uh, by a bit. And the response was incredibly, incredibly positive again. And it wasn't just people going, this is a good idea. People were now going, this is a good idea, take my money. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was fascinating to see that an open source product marketed as something very focused, very minimal, very simple, could gain such traction. It wasn't just developers who were backing, it was consumers, it was writers, it was authors, it was people going, I want to write with that thing, that looks good. Not, I want to hack on that thing, that looks like code I can get on board with. It was a mix. Um, so it started to validate this idea I've had, that there's not enough focus in open source, and that really focused products can bring open source to a far more mainstream audience. Um, so we did the Kickstarter campaign, got a shit ton of money, that was scary. It's like this roller coaster ride when you do Kickstarter, you're like, 10,000 euros, whoa, yeah. 25,000 euros, yeah, that's cool. 50,000 euros, I can't believe this much money is coming into my life, this is the best day ever. 80,000 euros, oh, this is a little bit scary now. 100,000 euros, fuck. 150,000 euros, I don't even care anymore. That's too, I don't, what, I don't understand that number. It's emotions. So, we had that, and the good thing was we could then get some people, so there were about three of us full-time at this point, um, working on it day in, day out, non-stop. And we had, um, this was developed behind closed doors, so not completely open source for the first three months. Um, and we had about 10 open source contributors also joined in, just volunteers. And in, on October 14th, um, this year, so about a month ago, a little bit more than a month ago, we launched uh, the first public version, which is 0 0.3. And the amazing, somewhat surprising thing is it actually works. It's pretty cool. Uh, just have to remember if I need to push this again to make it. Yeah, OK. So this is Ghost running. Um, this is latest master, so it's slightly more recent than 0 0.3.3. .3. And it is a fully functional Node.js application. So it's, I think, the world's first um, fully functioning blogging platform built 100% in JavaScript. And that was another part of the focus, was using the same programming language on the back end as well as the front end, because then your back end developers become your front end developers, and your front end developers become your back end developers, and everyone knows the entire application, there's less of a divide. And the response, again, has been very, very good. In the first month, um, we racked up 4 million page views, 85,000 user signups. Uh, 75,000 downloads, so of the zip package on the site, and 6,500 GitHub stars. And the most common question we get, which is essentially what a lot of you are thinking right now, is why Node.js? And it's probably, the, weirdly, like the only piece of negative feedback we got, really, was a couple of people going, Oh, Node.js, you're so stupid. Nobody can host Node.js. Why did you do that? And it's the only thing people got really like passionately angry about. And a few other people were just really confused. Like, why would you? It's a blogging, no real time, it's why? <laughs> and the answer is actually pretty simple. Um, if you start from scratch, you can choose any technology you want. And you look at the direction some of the most interesting projects are going at the moment, as well as some of the most interesting standards going in at the moment. So let's say HTML5 is probably one of the most interesting standards. Everything revolves around JavaScript. You have JavaScript APIs in the browser. You have JavaScript APIs in devices. They're everywhere. And it's getting more and more and more ubiquitous to the point where you can start doing some really, really interesting things. And the technology, um, or rather the library, Node.js, is evolving massively in maturity. So initially, to be honest, it started out as an experiment. It was, can we do this in Node.js? We can. And then we found out it actually works. And then we found out, well, hey, if we're going to create an open source community around this product, there's actually more JavaScript developers on GitHub than any other language by about 50%. So there's a huge, huge JavaScript community out there that's completely separate to this WordPress community that myself and Hannah, my partner in crime, uh, kind of came from. So we could tap into a new user base rather than segregating an old one. And there are some reasons why I think it was the right decision. Um, 
comparing old to new is always a fun thing to do. And there's a guy um, who's decided to do, I mean, you, I, I always say you can't really compare Ghost and WordPress now because they're two completely different things built on different technologies. But nevertheless, people try. Um, so this guy did a speed comparison test of WordPress, PHP, LAMP stack versus Ghost, Node.js, and well, he started out with Ghost on Nginx, then he did them both on Apache. Anyway, out of the box, what he found was that Ghost was 680% faster than WordPress by comparison. That was a pretty good baseline. When he put that up in the blog post, I was like, well, good. Um, especially since in the four-month development period from when we had the Kickstarter to launch 0.3, we don't even know what performance is at this point. We've not tested anything. So him putting up this blog post was like, wow, oh, that's cool. Didn't know that. Um, but then, of course, some people came back and they were like, well, that's ridiculous because nobody runs WordPress without opcache. Always. Which, let me tell you, after 10 years of working in WordPress is complete fucking bullshit. Nobody knows what opcache is except for about five developers who set it up and never even tell their customers what it is. Anyway, they said, it's not a fair comparison. You have to run WordPress with opcache and Ghost with no cache. Yeah. Um, so that, that drops the speed um, differential. Ghost was then only 190% faster. Um, but then the, this guy who's doing the load testing actually lightened the load from like real heavy influx of dig.com traffic. Why did I say dig.com? That's so 2008 of me. Uh, Hacker news traffic, let's go with that. And he, he just did the light load. So same configuration, op cache and ghost out of the box, um, just under kind of normal traffic, uh, normal load, as you will. And what he found then was that it was 1,900% faster, which is quite a lot. So the Node.js decision is a really interesting one, and in some ways a complicated one. But the way in which this technology is going is very, very, very interesting. And I compare loosely PHP hosts um, to kind of the oil industry at the moment, whereas Node.js hosts, I think, are more like the Tesla or the electricity coming through in the world. And I think there's going to be some fascinating overlap um, between how those two start to work together in the next few years. But there is always the question of what now? Um, because it's all very well and good to come up with an idea, say this is very focused and people agree with it, and say, okay, let's build it now. And people go, take my money. Um, and say, okay, we've built it now, here it is. Because Diaspora did all those things. And yet, where is it now? So we wanted to make sure that we weren't just creating a one-off thing going, <coughs> there it is, do something with it. We wanted this to actually have a life cycle, have its own ecosystem, be able to evolve and sustain itself, maybe even grow over the years, not just be a one-hit wonder and then die off like so many open source projects do, either due to funding running out, enthusiasm running out, or developers running out. Um, so I said in the video, we've created this as a, the whole thing is a non-profit organization. Every single part of it is a not-for-profit. Um, but at the same time, we want to have a business model um, to actually have some funding coming in. And the funding should then go into uh, funding further development of the core project. So the way we're doing that, because one of the most common complaints with Node.js is that it's hard to host, is by creating this hosted service where people can go in kind of a, a WordPress.com way and set up a couple of uh, text fields with some information and then click a button, and within the space of, I think, five or six seconds, it provisions Ghost on a server somewhere in our infrastructure, and you have a blog up and running. The biggest difference between this and something like WordPress.com is that this is creating individual instances of Ghost, which can run every theme, every plugin, every piece of third-party code they want to. It's not one giant social network type install. It's legitimate, small, independent instances of Ghost, which developers, if they so choose, can control the way they want. So the idea is that this should not only be the easiest, but also the most powerful way of hosting Ghost if you want to. So rather than going out and giving your five, ten, fifteen dollars a month to a hosting company, why not just give it to the Ghost Foundation, which we will then host your site for? And not only that, but your money will be going back into funding the open source project itself. So that's roughly where we are. Um, this this system is uh, in beta right now. We're 
we've got about a thousand people on it, rolling out to about a thousand a week now at the moment. Um, a huge amount of demand, so we're just trying to keep up with it and make sure that it's not going <laughs> to completely crash. Um, but that's that's pretty much where the Ghost Project is. Um, if I can just give you a couple of things to take away from what I've learned in this journey, I think it would have to be find a purpose. Um, I think this is missing from so many open source projects, is that we are very, very enthusiastic about building modules, about building platforms, about building stuff that people could use for anything. But sometimes there's a tremendous amount of value in building something specific that people can just use for that one thing. I think that's something worth thinking about. The second thing is say no. Please, just say no more often. If someone sends you a pull request or a patch or something to do something you never thought about or never envisioned, at least once in the next month, just say no without thinking about it and come back to it a month later and decide whether or not that no was a good idea. Make the technology work around the user. Don't make the user work around the technology. And this is slightly a design thing, it's slightly a user experience thing, but often we focus so much on the technology that the user is an afterthought. And sometimes it really, really benefits open source software, or any software for that matter, to spin that on its head. And the last is be confident, because when you try and focus, when you try and say no, when you try and create something minimal, when you try and create something a little bit different to what the open source ecosystem is used to, well, as Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you and then you win. So keep that in mind, and let's make open source better. Thank you. I think we've got around pretty short, so we've got time for questions, and then probably like even coffee and hangover treatment afterwards. Don't be shy. Anyone? Do we need mics? Or are we shouting? Hello, hello. Hello. So I think the difference is to Drupal it I think it does not place itself as a product, and I'm using Drupal because I build product, and it's a, the product for me is the platform. So, yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about that because you were criticizing that people are seeing open source projects as platforms, but you need to see them as platforms because they build different kinds of products. So, I don't always build the same products in my company, they are quite different. I, mm -hmm. I build e-learning websites, I build job boards, whatever. And I do that on a common platform because I know it and I know how to extend it, I know how to override it and what else. I think it, it depends on the perspective. So when you're building, let's say, themes for Drupal, you guys have themes, right? <laughs> when you're building themes for Drupal, your theme is the product and Drupal is the platform. That's clear. So the platform exists and you're building something on top of it. My point is to focus on the thing you're building as the product. So the people who are working on core Drupal should be thinking about Drupal as the product and the underlying architecture, the API, the now the Symfony stuff, that's the platform. But how can you make Drupal itself a product? So that's their perspective. Your perspective is they've now made a platform and I'm making a product. If someone extends your theme, they're looking at it from the perspective of you've made a platform, they make a product. But sometimes we skip a step and think of everything as a platform and go, well, someone else is going to make products out of this anyway. So it's just about aligning that thinking and putting yourself in the position of, well, what about just the use case of X? And I think there's value in that um, from any perspective. Despite, I know Drupal is a massive platform that can build a huge variety of things, but putting forward real use cases and building towards those use cases, I think, creates a better end user experience. Um, what were some of the complexities that you got uh, because you made a not-for-profit? Uh, like, uh, first of all, is it a real not-for-profit or is it um, a social business? Because I know that in the UK you have this special business type now. 
um, is, is uh, it's a real not-for-profit? or It depends what you define as not-for-profit, and this is something yeah. I had to learn very quickly. Um, okay. So in the US, a non-profit and a charity are the same things. <laughs> so they make no money, no business, they can only get donations, and they also have no tax. That's just non-profit, charity, that's everything in one ball. In the UK, we have a charity, which is something like uh, the Red Cross or NSPCC, things like this, and they get charities, no tax, that kind of stuff. But a non-profit is just a company, a normal company, and the difference is it cannot take its money out for the shareholders. Right. So it can't sell any part of the company, it can't distribute any of the profits of the company. Any money it makes can only be reinvested into the goals of the company, which in the case of Ghost Foundation is creating free software for the world. Right. So, and and what, what, what were the complexities that you bumped into when you, when you did that? Did, were there any things that made your life harder or? A lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> firstly, as I kind of just said, no one really knows what a non-profit is. It's really not common knowledge. And it's not common knowledge in tech. It's not common knowledge in business. It's not common knowledge in startups. It's not common knowledge anywhere. You go, I raised all this money on Kickstarter and I want to make a non-profit. And people go, why the fuck? Why would you do that? And it's because that's the philosophy behind it. That's the point of it. But no one knows what it is. So it's super hard to find advice. It's super hard to find um, accounting, technology. Where can we get tax breaks? Where can we not get tax breaks? Um, how should we take this funding now? Because as a for-profit company, you can take all this funding and go, this is share capital, tax-free. As a non-profit, you have all this money and you go, well, we have no shares. That means this is sales. That means we have to pay tax on sales. So that's where crowdfunding and non-profit go, we have laws from the 1800s and this shit does not work. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, and in general, it's a huge PR challenge of people not understanding what a non-profit is. And they go, well, if it's a non-profit, how are you going to pay for anything? They don't understand you can still make money, you can still have a business, but it's just not paying me uh, any money if I try and sell stuff to Zuckerberg because I have nothing to sell. So the PR has been the biggest challenge. The setup and the organizational side has also been a big challenge, and it varies so much from country to country. But I think it's, for me, that was a really important part of Ghost was to do it as this transparent project um, with a clear non-profit entity supporting it. Not a commercial company saying, here's a project and now we're gonna make shit tons of money. And yeah, there's a project, yeah. Um, because that's how a lot of uh, open source projects do it and I don't really agree with that. My, we were following much more along the lines of what Mozilla do. So Mozilla, a non-profit company, um, they make $680 million a year, so they do all right. And they do Firefox and I really like their structure. So it was following a lot uh, in their footsteps, I guess. Yeah? Any more? Ask me about WordPress. WordPress is fun. <laughs> I have a question about mathematics. How can something be more than 100% faster than something else? <laughs> <laughs> it's equivalent to being 19 times faster. So if WordPress loads in 19 seconds, Ghost loads in one second. It's 19 times faster, or 1,900% faster. Uh, hey, that's fucking good with a hangover. <laughs> I just got a mathematics question and answered it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so any other technical, non-technical questions? Feel free to raise your hand. WordPress, PR, open source, Drupal. Ask me about Drupal 8. <laughs> it's coming April 2014. You talked about uh, focus. Yeah. And my question is here, um, how will you keep that focus over time? Great question. Because now you, you're a small team and you can maybe manage that. So this has been a, quite a common one. People um, say that's interesting. You have this simple idea. WordPress started as a simple idea, and over years it turned out, it, uh, it transformed and changed into this big thing, this big project, because people came in with uh, requests, with feature ideas, and doing stuff. And the difference is not in trying to regulate what we do with people, it's in the focus of the core team and what we're working on. So, 
10 years ago, when WordPress started, there were arguably no really easy to use content management systems. So what you had was this blogging platform that got used for a bunch of stuff that it wasn't intended for because it was the best of a bad bunch. It was, WordPress is easy, we'll just use that to make a website, even though it's a blogging platform. And that got more and more common, and that grew. And as that grew and more and more people started using WordPress for websites, more and more people started going, we want website features. Give us this, give us that. And the core team went, whoa, OK, we've got a few million new users now, and they want these features. We should do this. So the perspective of WordPress shifted very much from this initial, we're just making a blogging platform, quite quickly to, because they were just having fun, they didn't have an original goal in mind of, oh, now we're appealing to user demand, to now we're making an application platform, which is what they call it now, that uh, anyone can do stuff with. So they shifted. Due to the nature of the market, um, their focus of the project from something simple to something complex. What, was, what we're saying with Ghost is people will try and make an e-commerce system on top of Ghost. They will try and make uh, a gallery on top of Ghost. They will try and make uh, seven different kinds of Drupal integrations for each version um, on top of Ghost. But the focus of the core team will always be on publishing, will always be on blogging. And I think that defines what the ecosystem does. What the core does in its APIs, what the core does in its functionality, enables the wider ecosystem. As soon as WordPress introduced uh, custom post types, as soon as it introduced multi-site, we saw huge, huge movement in the plugin and theme community of people creating things like BB Press, multi-site installs, uh, custom post types to create products instead of posts out of everything. So as soon as the core team focus introduces a new piece of functionality around CMS or application platform, the ecosystem responds and uses that functionality. So our perspective is just, if we focus rigorously and continuously on doing stuff around publishing and blogging and introduce features and functionality around that, what I hope is that the ecosystem will go along with that and create their own features and their own use cases for what we're building. So what? <laughs> you had any conversations with WordPress people lately? Absolutely. How do they react to you? Uh, it's it's a critique. Well, it's it's interesting. WordPress introduced Markdown yesterday. <laughs> um, no, it's it's. I have a lot of friends at WordPress. I worked uh, with the core team for the better part of three years, and know a lot of people there. And they, I know they talk about it a lot. And um, some, it's interesting to see some of the ideas from Ghost make their way back into WordPress or kind of react as a result of WordPress. So I think about two weeks after I first put up this blog post idea, uh, WordPress announced a back to blogging approach, <laughs> which was probably coincidental. Um, they introduced a new theme, which was blog focused. Um, and then they really kicked up their game, which was so cool to see. Um, they have new development standards, new development practices. They have new people managing releases. They really, really picked up the pace of development. And some things, you could argue, look like they're related to Ghost. Um, some things look like they're going in a completely different direction. But I think it's good. I think it's pushing everyone to be better. And that's a, a good thing to see. But yeah, I, I love what WordPress is doing. And I still use WordPress regularly. Our marketplace is powered by WordPress. Um, the only thing is, I think, for blogging, you can do something new and different. But for everything else, I really like WordPress. OK, I'd like to take two more questions. But Drupal is obviously better. <laughs> uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Node.js is hard to install or for many people. Yeah. And that's the reason why you put on a service with yeah. Ghost. Um, but for me, the main point with free software is that I control everything. Yeah. And yeah, you said you the users could actually have their own node or their own installation, basically, yep. with this service. But it's still on your servers. It's still a service. So yep. they cannot reinvent it whole or deinstall it completely and do whatever they want. So it's still in the terms of your server, and it's a service. Yep. So in my opinion, it's somehow a contradiction to the idea of free software. I know it's happening a lot, and if you want to do it, you can still do it, and nobody yep. has to complain about it, because they can install it if they want to. Right. But you mentioned it as a solution for those people who want to be in control. Yeah. And I think that is a bit of a contradiction. Well, I think, I think you have extremes. I think you have extremes and you have balances. And you have people who want control and you have people who want easy to use. Right? And at every single point in between these two points, 
there's a use case for someone with a certain skill level. And you're probably here. You want maximum control of everything. And that's okay, that's good. But what you have to understand is for everyone that's here, if these people use our service and pay us $5 a month, they're enabling this last part to be possible. Because without that funding, without people using it continuously, or without uh, putting money back into the platform, it wouldn't exist at all. So I actually agree with you. This little part at the, at the that extreme end of the spectrum is where you should have ultimate control, and it's the ultimate purity. It's the ultimate, um, <laughs> what's the opposite of realism? <laughs> what, you, what you really would like, idealism, there you go. It's the most idealistic view of what open source software should be, and I share that view. And the rest of it is trying to make that view work. So it's about finding a balance between both. Hello. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, blogging and about publishing. Um, how do you see the role of blogging in, in the modern world uh, as opposed to the traditional media, big media companies? I mean, blogging has been real important in recent history in, in the Middle East, for example. I just wonder what your view of, of, is of blogging in, in the modern world. It's the thing that excites me most about the web, I think. Um, which is no small feat. Um, blogging is, uh, when you had this early kind of weblog dawn of blogging, we thought of blogging as just a teenager in a bedroom with some angsty views about his girlfriend that just broke up with him and then he went on and made a website about, called Facebook or something. Um, and it was just this journal type thing. But if you think about what is the modern definition of a blog, CNN is a blog, Mashable is a blog, The New York Times is a blog, The Guardian is a blog, Der Standard is a blog. Hey. Um, every publication online is a blog. If you define a blog as a regularly updated website of published content in a chronological order, a lot of things are a blog now. So when we think about blogging, I'm really talking about online publishing. I would love it. My long-term goal for Ghost is not just that it makes it easy for people to write a blog, it's that it could empower journalism around the world and for larger publications. Um, if you look at the systems uh, that people are using at newspapers, large magazines, they're ridiculous, they're horrific. They're like from the 90s with 50,000 text inputs, which all store one number in a relational database that try and make something work together. And they start writing in Adobe Image Ready. Image Ready? Yeah. And then they use an XML API to export that to this weird Web 1.0 0.1, I don't know what the hell it is, system. Um, so if we could create an open source platform or products, which could even serve, do a little bit better than that, that would be amazing as well. And without doubt, the blogging from behind walls scenario of Middle East, of uh, countries which don't have the same freedoms that we do is a huge motivation. And that's something I love about open source software in general. But yeah, the blogging use case is so wide and it enables <laughs> so many things, so many smarter people than me to publish better ideas than I have. I love it. I think it's fascinating. It'll keep me going for a while. Sorry, just uh, for a follow-up on this last question. Where are you? Um, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Does you or your project, the Ghost Project, yeah. has any journalistic ambition? Just in the, word, uh, in the meaning of uh, freedom of speech? Certainly. Talk? Talk Certainly. Probably in the biggest sense, in terms of getting ghosts into the hands of people who do have journalistic ambition. Um, I myself very much enjoy writing, I very much enjoy journalism, I very much enjoy that whole community, but I probably am better off focusing on the software side of things. Um, but I think about empowering and enabling the people who have a voice or the people who need to have a voice is one of the biggest parts of that. And I'm excited to see what use cases there will be. Um, over the years. It's still very young, 0 0.3. So, okay. thanks a lot. I, I think this is, uh, so this is like a platform for journalists, probably, your product. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, big applause for John and Nolan and enjoy the rest of the day.